very thankful to tell you that Chloe was water baptized. She's one of our students. She was water baptized in between our services. That's exciting, folks. That's exciting. And we're very happy for Chloe. We'll be giving her that baptismal certificate this next weekend, but we're very happy for her. And uh, thank you, Pastor Larry, for keeping us informed of everything going on this week. A very exciting week here at the church. Amen. If you've got Luke 15 in your Bible, would you say, I'm there? All right. Now, if you look around and someone doesn't have a Bible near you, why don't you just scoot over next to them and let them borrow your Bible, all right? Let them look on that leather-bound Bible, check out that iPad, look at that tablet. Amen. And I believe the Lord is going to speak to us today. Luke 15, verse number 1. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and the sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? When he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. When he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say, Jesus speaking, says, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Amen. I want to preach for just a few minutes on a, a message I've simply entitled, Lost and Found. Would you say that title with me, Lost and Found? You know what dawned on me this morning when I was driving to church? But By the way, this is not what dawned on me, but how many of you have ever misplaced something in a public place and you went up to someone and said, can you tell me where the lost and found is? Has anybody ever done that before? You know what it dawned on me driving to church today? And you have to forgive me, I'm kind of simplistic. Is Shouldn't it just be called the lost? Because until someone comes and finds it, it's not found. The lost. But I'm here to tell you, I'm not going to preach just about the lost but the lost and the found, and the found. Amen. Lord Jesus, would you take the words that I preach right now, Lord, and let them be eternal words. God, I can't do it in my own. I need your spirit to help me today as a preacher. And God, every one of us in this house today needs your spirit to illuminate our hearts and our minds and our understanding, Lord. So we open up to you right now. We give ourselves to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Be glorified through this message today. God, I will thank you in the name of the Lord. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. The first line of the article caught my attention. The reason why it caught my attention is because it spoke of something that I enjoy very much, and that is donuts. If you don't know me, I like donuts. So much so that one of the donut shops around here that will remain nameless makes one certain type of donut every Sunday morning. They only make one, and you're looking at the man that they make it for. That's how much I like donuts. And so I was riveted by the first line of this article. A man by the name of Samuel Key wrote these words. I'm sitting in a donut shop. I've been here many times, and nobody has ever complained about this place, saying, this donut shop is too donutty. It's a donut shop, so you'd expect it to be donutty. No one has ever said that a sporting event was too sporty, a library too booky, a concert too musicy. An airport too plainy, a home too homey, a college too
too schooly or a hospital too hospitally. Yet I hear all the time that church was too churchy. To which he says, what else should it be? Why the double standard? Why do we condemn the church for being about Jesus, spirituality, conviction of sin, heaven, hell, salvation, righteousness, and judgment? We surely don't complain that a donut shop offers Boston cream and cinnamon buns and apple fritters and cream sticks and jelly filled and glazed and blueberry cake. Yes, I want some right now. Because some churches are listening to this sort of cultural critique, it's gotten ridiculous. Since some churches actually believe that they should not be churchy, they try to hide their spiritual donuts, if you know what I mean. Participants can attend, be fairly comfortable and entertained without being confronted with too many spiritual matters. Then right at the end, a little Jesus is slipped in. But that's like going to the hospital only to have doctors and nurses pal around with you, never addressing your physical condition, but right at the end when you're about to go to your car, some nurse's aide slips a little medicine in your pocket with an apology. All the time what I need is surgery and an IV, but they were afraid of offending me. They were afraid to tell you how sick you were. They didn't want to appear intolerant because they were the only ones in town with the cure. And on and on Samuel Key goes. Now, this morning on this Sunday morning, this January morning in 2015, I want to be very clear with what I preach. I don't want to be vague. I don't believe that probably anybody will walk out of here today saying that preacher came in the side door or the back door. I'm going to come right through the front door today. But I pray and I have prayed that God will help me to preach it in a way that people grasp and people understand that the church was never designed by God to simply be a social club. God's church, and let me go on record as saying I thank God for fellowship. I thank God for fellowship. One of the things that we will do across this central Arkansas area Wednesday night is we will have a great time of fellowship in homes and we will discuss the word of God and we will bond together. It's a great time. I encourage you to be a part of small groups. But I thank God for fellowship, but fellowship is not the end result for a church. Fellowship is not the thing that the church was designed to be. God's church, according to the word of the Lord, is designed to be a soul-saving station. God's church is designed to be a place where a person can walk in with the filth of sin on their life. But thank God I didn't leave the way that I came. I walked in with sin on my life, but when Jesus touched me, when his spirit helped me, when the confrontation between my unrighteousness and his holiness was complete, I realized I've got to change. I need a cleansing in my life. I need to be redeemed. I need a change in my future. I've got good news for somebody today. If you came in here feeling a little bit lost, there's a God that wants to find you today. If you came in wandering a little bit, wondering, is my marriage salvable? Is there something that can be done for my children? Is there any hope for healing in my body? I'm rising to this pulpit to tell you there is a Savior and a healer and a deliverer and a hope giver that is in this house today. Come on, I'm thankful for the power of God's church. And I'm thankful for the purpose of God's church. In Luke chapter 15, some uh, Bibles will simply put above the passage the chapter of lost things. A lost sheep, a lost coin, a story of a lost son. 
And yet, in order to understand Luke 15 correctly, we got to get the context of it. It actually begins back in Luke chapter 14, where Jesus has just spent a considerable amount of time in the home of one called a chief Pharisee. A Pharisee was a religious ruler of the day, and Jesus put himself in that home and began to teach, spend time, and expound to them. Something happened as a result of that teaching time that was not unusual in the life of Jesus. People were riveted by the, at the words of Jesus and, 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 and the, the, it seemed to captivate him. And, and everybody came together. In fact, Luke 14 and 25 says that great multitudes came and gathered around Jesus. And so in one chapter, you have Jesus in a home of a religious leader and then great multitudes following him because of that. But the scene shifts in the first verse of Luke 15, where the Bible simply says, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and the sinners for to hear him. And now the audience is not religious elite. The audience is not the socially excelling. It's not even just the multitudes, but now the Bible says sinners and publicans are gathered around Jesus. Publicans were low-class citizens. They were individuals who society looked down upon. Sinners were exactly that. They were without redemption. And yet Jesus was such an attractive speaker, and there was an attractional quality about this man named Jesus that even those without redemption, even those apart from his virtuous words, even those looked down by society said, I see something in this man that I want to get close to. And they came to him and they gathered around him. Jesus was an attractive man. He had an attractive spirit. Now, you can tell an awful lot about the spirituality of a person by how they treat people of lower degree than them. People who can give them nothing. People who really can add very little value to their life. That's where we see the real person. And all that had to happen was Jesus start having conversations with sinners and publicans, and the Pharisees started murmuring. Now, it's not in your Bible, but when you look at the word murmur, embedded within that is the word whisper. So I want you to get the picture. Jesus is sitting, teaching, and publicans and sinners, low social and economic classes are all around him. And the Pharisees are seemingly on the outside of that discourse, and they're whispering to one another. Have you ever noticed that very infrequently do we whisper positive things? You ever notice that? We don't come into church on Sunday morning, and most of the time, now sometimes there's exceptions to this, but most of the time we don't lean over to our husband and whisper and say, man, his suit really is sharp. Because if we think that, we'll find him and tell him ourselves. You know what many times we're prone to do, we're prone to do? His shirt doesn't match his pants. I wouldn't be caught dead in that outfit. She wore that two weeks ago. They're murmuring. And they're saying among themselves, you can read this in verse number two, this man, this Jesus, receives sinners and eateth with them. What does that mean? That means he is open and he is welcoming to people beneath him. He's open to sinners. He welcomes them into his presence. He wants them nearby. And can I tell you something on this Sunday morning? It is embedded within these verses in Luke 15 that we begin to see a little bit of the DNA of what makes Jesus Jesus, and that's this. He welcomes sinners near him. 
He wants people who don't have anything to offer him to draw near to him. He is attractive to people that are without. And so just perchance we walk into New Life Church on this Sunday morning and we've got some things in our life that aren't put together. They're undone. We got ragged edges on our, our, our life. Can I tell you something? Jesus wants us near him. He's not pushing us away. He's not telling us to go away. He's saying, come unto me, all ye who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He wants us near. Turn to someone and say, Jesus wants you near him. It's in these verses in Luke 15. Please keep your Bible close. It's in these verses that we see some outstanding principles of the ministry of Jesus Christ that last to this day. In Luke chapter 15 and verse 4, I want you to see this word. Jumps off the page at me when I read it. What man of you, Luke 15 and 4, having a hundred sheep, if he lose, everyone say lose, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost. Would you say lost? Would you skip down in your Bible to verse number 8? Either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle, and sweep the house, and seek diligently until she finds it. Look at verse 24, please. For this my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost, everyone say lost, and is found. Jesus cares intensely about lost things. Jesus cares intensely about lost humanity. Jesus is very interested in people here this morning that feel lost. If you walked in and your life seems to be in a tailspin and everything is confusing and you feel completely and utterly lost, can I tell you, Jesus is interested in lost things. You and I do not have to go but just about three pages over from Luke 15 where we will find the absolute purpose of Jesus coming to this earth. He's talking to Zacchaeus in Luke 19 and he makes this statement, the Son of Man, verse 10 of Luke 19, has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Hear me, brothers and sisters. Hear me, guests and friends, on this Sunday morning. Lost Things matter to Jesus. Lost hope matters to Jesus. Lost lives matter to Jesus. Lost futures matter to Jesus. Lost children matter to Jesus. Lost dreams matter to Jesus. He does not turn a blind eye or a deaf ear to our lostness. He's interested in our lostness. He wants us to draw near to him. Now, I think it's interesting in Luke 15 that it opens with a very vivid detail of how this all unfolds. A, a shepherd is putting his flock in the fold at night and he notices he's a good shepherd, so he counts. He's supposed to have 100 sheep there. 95, 6, 97, come on, Bessie. 98, 99. I probably counted wrong. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 68, 70, 72, 74, 92, 94, 6, 98. Three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen. Ninety three, ninety six, ninety nine. Now we have no biblical precedent that the shepherd looked at an almost complete fold and ever said, That's good. Why? Because it wasn't complete 
until that 100 sheep was in the fold. He wasn't satisfied with 99 out of 100. Now me, a test that I take, on 99, sign me up. But 99% is not good enough for Jesus. We don't have precedent that the woman, a few verses into Luke 15, who realized she's counting her money. And she realizes, I'm missing a coin. Oh, uh, I got three quarters. That's good enough. I got 90% of what I've been saving. That's good enough. No, she found that she was missing just one coin, but that wasn't good enough. You see, it is within this passage that Jesus is symbolized as a shepherd and a diligent individual looking for that which is missing. Can I tell you something? Hear this preacher right now. If you're not in the fold of God's church, you're missing and Jesus wants to find you. The church is not complete without every sheep in the fold, every coin in the purse, every son at home. Jesus really does care about lost things. I want you to notice what the scripture says here in Luke 15. The shepherd leaves the 99 and he goes looking in the wilderness. I don't know how you call sheep. Come on, whoop, whoop, whoop. Now, don't all do it at one time, but how many, how many of you can put your, your whistle? How, how many can put your, like, Joe, can you do that? Can you do that for us real so quick? Oh, yeah. All right, so get, get the picture here. The shepherd is, is missing that one sheep. There's 99. I mean, shouldn't that be good enough? No, not for this shepherd. And so he goes out and he keeps whistling over and over. See, I wish I could do that. Maybe one of these days the anointing will come on me and I'll be able to put my fingers in my mouth and whistle like that. I promise you when that happens, you can look up at the platform and go, the anointing's on pastor right now. Whistling, trying to get that sheep's attention. And the Bible says that the shepherd looked for the sheep, watch this now, until he found it. He wasn't willing to put the sheep on a clock and say, you got four minutes to get here. If you don't get here in four minutes, it's over with. If you don't show up in two days, it's over with. No, the shepherd in his love and in his care for that flock said, I'm going to get out where the sheep is and I'm going to look for it until, hear me right now, until I find it. That woman sweeping that house, realizing the coin is missing, the Bible says she kept sweeping. She kept looking. She kept scouring with her eyes, trying to find the coin. And she kept at it until she found it. Can I tell you something? This is the picture of Jesus in our life. He is standing here this morning. And the reason why life sometimes seems upside down is because there's a searching going on. There's a Savior going into the wilderness throughout the house looking for that which is lost. And he's willing to search until he finds it. That is the essence of grace. How many of you right now have some coins in your pocket? Well, Jerry, I know my dad does. In fact, Pop, come here just a second. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Those of you who are new to our church, this is new information. I've never shared this before. Come here, Pop. This is not planned. I promise you, this has not been choreographed. Come on up here, Pop. This is my father, by the way, those of you who are new to our church. Great man. Now, this is going to prove if I know my father or not. I would venture to say that in one of the pockets of my dad's trousers right now is some coins. Am I correct? Now, would you do me a favor? And I'm going to come right over here so maybe we can get this in the mic. Would you come over and just stick your hand, whatever pocket those coins are in, just jingle them a little bit. Would you do that? You don't have to pull them out. Just jingle them a little bit. See, now, to y'all, that means nothing. To me, that brings back memories. Because I can remember as a two- and three-year-old boy laying on a pew trying to get my rest in church. 
And my dad would be jingling his change over there, keeping me awake. And I'm wanting to go, shh, quit preaching up there. I'm trying to sleep. Jingling that change. Can I see how much money you got, Pop? Do you mind? I'm a little bit busted today. I need a little. All right, let's see here. Oh, I'm dropping money. My dad today has seventy-five dollar, dollar twenty-five. He's 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 rich today. He got a dollar twenty-seven in his pocket. Now here's the thing: any of you are ever you need coffee money or you you're, you need a coke after church? Here's the guy you come to right here, because he's always got about a dollar twenty-seven in his pocket at any time. You know, if I was to say, uh, Pop, I tell you what, I'll give you a dollar twenty-five back. And I'll take two. How about that? Is that a good That's deal? Good. That's good. Yeah, you, you take that. And then you stay right there. You can put that back in your pocket. And I'm just going to take two. See, see here, here's, here's where we get it wrong sometimes. We look at our lives and we think, woe is me. I'm unworthy. I'm insignificant. And compared to the quarters in the pocket, we feel like a couple of copper pennies. Just insignificant. You know, the stuff that falls on the sidewalk and we don't even take the time to bend down and pick it up. Why? Because we probably make enough money in our lifetime that by the time we reach down and pick it up, we've already made more than what's laying on the sidewalk. There's not a lot to this right here. But I've come to tell somebody, you may feel worthless. You may feel insignificant. You may look at your life and the decisions you've made and think, compared to other people, I am so far down. How could God ever love me? I feel unworthy. But I want to tell you something. He is a God that you put two pennies lost in a house. He's going to keep on looking until he finds those pennies. You say, I'm not worth much, pastor. Let me tell you what you're worth. You're worth the cross of Calvary. You're worth a crown of thorns. You're worth stripes upon his back. That's how much lost people are worth to Jesus. Come on, he wants to search for you until he finds you. Thank you, Pop. I'll see you after church. I'll get some of that paper in your wallet. <laughs> Everybody shouted at pastor. Say, until. Yeah. Look at somebody and say, until. Yeah. How long is the shepherd going to look? He's going to look until he finds the sheep. How long is the lady going to sweep? She's going to sweep until she finds the coin. How long is the father going to step out on the porch and look for the lost son? He's going to look for him until the son comes home. He cares about lost people. He cares. He cares about lost people. And he'll search until he finds you. Now, there, there's one part of this that I will close with today. That is just awesome to me. You ever read the Bible and you just shake your head and go, man, that is so awesome. I do that all the time. I've been reading this book for years and there's times I read it and it'll just come, come alive to me all over again. I want you to look at this in your Bible. Look, Luke 15 and verse 5. When he had found it, the sheep... He layeth it on his shoulders. We have that on the screen. What's that next word? W would you read that verse on the screen with me? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders. What's the next word? Rejoicing. Look at verse number nine. And when she hath found it, the coin, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Look at verse number 22. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. Verse 32, it was meet that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. There is embedded within the finality of each of these stories something so marvelous, and that is this. When the lost is found, great rejoicing breaks forth. I want you to see this in your mind. When that shepherd is in the wilderness, the Bible does not say that when he finally 
finds the 100th sheep in the wilderness. That he takes that sheep, puts it on his shoulders, and goes back to the fold, and then starts a party. The Bible says that when the shepherd finds the sheep in the wilderness, he puts it on his shoulders, and he begins rejoicing in the wilderness. That sheep is not back to the fold yet, but it's in the right hands. That coin is not back in the bank yet, but it's in the owner's hand. That son is not back in great standing in the house yet, but he's headed in the right direction. I want to ask us a question on this Sunday morning. Are we willing to rejoice, not when perfection comes, but when we see something turning in the right direction? Ha, ha, ha. I may not have it all figured out yet, but I'm turning toward Jesus. My kids may not be back at the altar yet, but I see them turning toward Jesus. I may not have a complete deliverance yet, but I've gone three days and the urge is not as bad as it was before. There's a little turning toward Jesus. That's the time for someone to rise up in their spirit and begin to rejoice and begin to dance. Why? Because it's headed in the right direction. Come on, somebody. I'm going to rejoice when there's a turning toward Jesus. Now, I'm going to tell you, I'm just going to be real transparent with you today. Those of you that are a part of this church, you will know I get very, very happy when people are water baptized back here in this baptistry. Those of you that know me, I get cranked up when people are baptized. This morning in between our services, Pastor Larry came to me and he said, we're going to have a baptism, Pastor. Chloe, one of our young men's girlfriends from the youth group, she's going to be baptized. And I was on my way to our newcomer's reception, and you all didn't know this because you weren't inside of me, but all the way down the hallway, I'm going, yes, 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 inside. Because somebody else is realizing i got to have my sins washed away in baptism. There's nothing like that. There's nothing like that. Can I just say today, I wouldn't be worth my weight in salt if I didn't say this. If you've got sins on your life, you don't have to leave here with those sins. You can do just like Chloe did and have those sins washed away in the waters of baptism. You don't have to leave with those sins. But I get excited. We give away baptismal certificates and this church, if you haven't been here when we give those away, this church comes alive when we give those baptismal certificates. People stand, standing ovation, clapping, whooping, hollering. Why? Because of the great. But can I just tell you something? I'm going to be real transparent. I think over the years, as I've been preparing for this, I may have done a disservice to this church. I don't get nervous. Don't throw anything at me. You want to know why? Because here's what the Bible says. The Bible says there is joy in the presence of the angels over one sinner that repents. So I don't have the right to postpone my rejoicing until the sins are washed away. Because while I'm doing that, heaven is having a party over one person on a Sunday morning that bows their knee and closes their eyes and prays a prayer and says, God, I'm tired of doing everything on my own. I am turning toward you. When there is a turning away from sin and a turning to Jesus, there is a party and a celebration and joy that happens in heaven. Oh, I wonder what's happening in heaven this morning when somebody says, Lord, I'm getting ready to turn back to you. I'm coming back to you. I'm getting back right with you. There's joy and there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels. That's exciting. Amen. Now, I'll finish with this. And, and, and I won't read all the verses, but you can look this up when you go home. There is a vivid tale in 2 Samuel chapter 6 of David and the children of Israel who are 
wanting so desperately to get the Ark of the Covenant, that box that symbolized such great things to the children of Israel, they wanted to get it back to the city of David, to Jerusalem. Now we have to understand what that box represented. It was a box about two and a half feet long, about a foot and a half high, about two and a half feet, or a foot and a half wide, about two and a half feet tall. It was made out of wood, but it was overlaid within and without with gold. It was more than just a box with a lid and some angels on the top of it made out of gold. See, because in that box were some very important articles. The first was a pot of manna. That was symbolizing the provision of God in the wilderness. When they were without food, God sent supernatural food from heaven, giving them what they need. There was also Aaron's rod. It was meant to give direction and guidance. And yet Aaron's rod budded supernaturally, showing the supernatural power of God in their midst. And then there was the tablet, which was the word of God given to the children of Israel. And so that ark, that box, meant so very much. It meant the very essence, the very spirit of God, the very essence of who God was. And David wanted it so desperately in Jerusalem that he built a house for it, a place for it that when they get it back from the enemy, they would place it there and it would always be in their midst. Second Samuel chapter six says that as they are transporting the ark on a platform, if you will, men have poles with the platform in between and they're carrying the ark back to Jerusalem. That the ox that's helping carry and guide, it stumbles and the, the, the ark begins to tip over and one man, I, I believe just innocently wanting to stabilize the ark because of what it meant, puts his hand out, his name is Yuza, and he touches the ark to stabilize it. And unfortunately, according to the law, anybody who touched that ark would be killed and he was struck dead on the spot. And this angered David and it scared the children of Israel. So much so that they didn't want to even touch, they didn't want to go near the ark, specifically not touch it. And so they brought it down the road to a man's house by the name of Obed-Edom. And they decided, we're just going to put it here for right now. This has kind of freaked us out. But we're just going to let it stay here for right now. Now, can, can I just tell you, think about this with me. It's got a place prepared for it in Jerusalem. Obed-Edom is not planning on it being in his house. I mean, put yourself in Obed-Edom's shoes. You wake up one morning, the kid's got toys on the floor. There's dirty dishes in the sink. You haven't dusted in a while. And the next thing you know, there's people bringing a box that symbolizes the very presence of God and putting it in your living room. Honey, clean up a little bit. Run the vacuum a little bit. We got this box here. He wasn't prepared for it. But here's what the Bible says. As long as the box was in the house of Obed-Edom, the blessing of God was on that man's house. <laughs> Think about it. His wife never cooked so good. Everything at his job seemed to work out right. The kids lived in peace and harmony. They went to bed on time. Nobody ever lost their cell phone. Everything prospered as long as the box was there. Why? Because that was representative of the Spirit of God. Now, I will tell you, I think they still had days like they always had, but there was a special favor that was on their life because of that box being with them. And can I tell somebody on this Sunday morning, there is such favor when the presence of God's in your life. That's why this preacher will rise and say this often, be filled with the Spirit. Be touched by the Spirit. Let the Spirit of God baptize your life. Why? Because I found it to be true. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is favor and there is blessing and there is power. That's the, that's the presence of God. Now, it came to the attention of several in David's cabinet. Hey, how come Obed-Edom has all the favor? 
that box belongs in Jerusalem. So a period of several months goes by. Finally, they get with David and they said, King, listen, this, is, this ought not to be. Let's go down to Obed-Edom's house. Let's get the box. It's been a while now. Let's get the box. Let's bring it back to Jerusalem. So I want us to get this picture in our mind. I need uh, Landon, Herman, Jacob, come here, Colby. Y'all, y'all come here just a second. This is the ark right here. This signifies the blessing of God. This is the favor of God. This is the touch of God. This means the difference between success and a lack of success. Come here, I need Landon and Herman, come over here. I want each of you guys to grab a leg of this chair. On the count of three, I just want you to pull it up in the air and hold it up in the air. You ready? Just the leg. One, two, three. Up you go. That's awesome. Finally, Israel has the ark. And we're heading back to Jerusalem with what belongs in Jerusalem. Finally. And the scripture says that on that processional from Obed-Edom's house to Jerusalem, they go six paces. That's not a long way. That's not at all how long it takes to get to Jerusalem. That's just the start of the journey. But they go six paces. Stay right here with me, guys. Is that too heavy for you? You all right? Good. Okay. They go six paces. And David says, stop the procession. Stop. We haven't gone far, but we need to sacrifice and we need to praise and we need to rejoice right now. We need to stop the procession. I know, I know it's not back to Jerusalem yet. I know we've just started on the journey, but we've got to stop long enough to rejoice, and we've got to stop long enough to praise, and we've got to stop long enough to sacrifice. I want to ask you a question. How can they do that when it's not back to Jerusalem yet? I believe that David understood it may not be back where it belongs yet, but it is headed in the right direction. Woo. I want to ask you something. I'm going to say it again. Can we rejoice when we see somebody just turn toward Jesus? Can we rejoice? Hey, I know it's not perfect yet. I know we haven't got all the answers yet. But when we see the ark heading back toward Jerusalem, when we see it up on the platform and we see a procession heading in the right direction, Come on, somebody. I think it's time to alert our mouths to speak faith. I'm going to rejoice in what I see happening. It's not perfect yet, but I see it on the way. Rejoice. And so off they go. Come on, guys. We're getting the favor back. We're bringing the glory back. We're getting the spirit back in the right place. I've prepared a place for it. It's not arbitrary. It's not happenstance. But I've prepared for this visitation. I've prepared for this Ark of the Covenant. I have prepared for this to be back in this place. I've prepared. I got my mind geared up. I'm coming back to Jerusalem. I'm bringing the, come on up here guys, I'm bringing the favor of God back to Jerusalem. I'm tired of trying to live my life and organize my family and lead my life without the favor of God. I walked in here today and I'm saying, God, I'm turning toward you. I'm coming toward you. I need you more than I need anything else in my life. There are people under the sound of my voice that are making decisions today. I once was lost but today I'm gonna be found I wish everybody in the house would stand with me right now Spirit of the Lord is here today Spirit of God's in this house today just come up here guys with that real quick just come up here I'm gonna ask a very simple question and I know we're using a homemade illustration here you stand right there Isn't it about time that we got the ark back where it belongs? 
I don't want to learn to live without the ark, without the favor of God, without the blessing of God, without the touch of God. I'm going to ask nobody to move in and out right now, but everybody would just close your eyes with me. Oh, Jesus. God, I feel your presence in this room right now. God, I know most assuredly you've been talking to me. You've been talking to people all throughout this message. God, in the last few minutes, you've let my eyes be open to who you're talking to, and I'm thankful for that. I give you praise for that, Lord. I know your heavy hands on this service right now, Lord, and you're wanting somebody, anybody, just to turn toward you. Just to turn toward you. And there will come rejoicing. There will come praise. There will come celebration. We just turn, just turn, just turn. Just turn toward you, Jesus. I want to ask it again. What about the ark? What about the presence of God? What about the ark? I, I, want, to, I want to ask for your indulgence. And everybody that's here, would you listen to Pastor just for a moment? I would like to have the privilege in just a minute of us all joining together and praying together around the front of this church. To all of our guests that are here, nobody's going to do anything weird. You'll hear it from my mouth before we do it. But there is such a strength that comes when people come together in prayer. So would you give me the honor of praying with you? If you would, would you come from everywhere? Everybody in the house, would you come and join us around the front here before we go home? Come on. Just, just come in. You can fill up the middle area too here. Praise God. At for sake of, or at risk of sounding repetitive, I feel constrained in my spirit to ask this question again. What about the ark? Don't forget the ark. It's that presence of God that makes life full of life and not just existence. Now, for those of you that are new to our church, I entered into full-time ministry when I was 18 years old. So I'm 44 now. So 26 years ago. And when I entered into full-time ministry, I started hearing a statement over and over again from people, especially when we would come to a time of prayer and the statement would be something like this. It wasn't always verbatim this, but something like this. Preacher, I feel so unworthy. I don't think God would take me. You don't know what I've done. You don't know the times that I've started and then I've stopped and I've started and I've stopped. I don't feel worthy of what Jesus could do for me. I wanna to say to some that know me well, and to some who this is the first time we've ever had the privilege to meet. If we were worthy, why would we need Jesus? If, if I could do this on my own, why would we need the cross? See, it might seem like weakness to turn to him but actually it's strong God I'm lost but I don't want to stay like that I want you to find me today so
So I don't know where you are. I don't know what you're feeling. I don't know what you brought in here today. But I know that the one that finds us is here in this sanctuary right now. So I'm going to ask us to do something. I'm going to ask for a couple of people to get with a couple of people. Now don't do it yet. But I just want us to feel together the strength of this church family. Because you know, and listen, you've been so kind to listen to me as I preach today. But we're strongest when we're together, not when we're separated. So in just a minute, I'm going to have you turn. And nope, we're, I'm telling you, everything's going to happen. I'm going to have a couple people get with a couple of people. Just get together. And we're just going to pray for one another. And if you need to turn to Jesus, you can do that right then. You can just talk to him. Say, God, I turn to you right now. I'm sorry. That's what repentance is. It's a turning to Jesus, a turning away from our sin and giving ourselves to the Lord. Lord, I'm sorry for the actions, the reactions, the ways, the conduct, the, the attitudes that I've had. Please forgive me, Lord. So can you just find two or three people to join up with right now? Praise God. I want you to look around. Church family, I want you to look around. I want you to make sure you see some people around you that need prayer. Woo. Now, can I just tell you something? What you are feeling is the presence of God right now. Nobody needs to feel ashamed. Nobody needs to feel embarrassed. That's the spirit of the Lord that we feel in this sanctuary right now. Why don't you just link up? Just kind of close that circle in. Just come together. Close that circle in. We're going to pray together right now, Lord. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Come on, that's beautiful. Thank you, God. Why don't you just talk to the Lord? Just turn to Him. What about the ark? What about the ark? What about the ark? What about the ark? Come on, that's it. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Go ahead and cry out to the Lord. Go ahead and cry out to the Lord. Oh, yes, Lord. 